Hello all and welcome to Stingray Toms Florida and another Take 5 for Florida History. Today I'll be looking at two of St. Augustine's early cemeteries, the Tolomato and Huguenot cemeteries, both located near the old city gates and the Castillo de San Marcos. They are generally close to the public, so millions of visitors have walked past them over the years only to have wondered about their stories. So let's head to St. Augustine and look at these two fascinating places to contain so much of Florida's early history. Enjoy! Recently I was able to visit both cemeteries and had the opportunity to not only explore them, but I was able to speak with the presidents of each cemetery's preservation association. I'm going to share their interviews because who better to tell you about the history? I was also lucky enough to run into a remarkable group from the Jimenez Fatio House Museum in St. Augustine, who was also visiting the both cemeteries. Like the two cemetery presidents, they too will be sharing a fascinating story in this video. But like all things history related, I'm going to need to give you a bit of background. So let's go back to the founding of St. Augustine itself especially since many viewers here are not likely to know much of the early history of Florida. 1565 is when the story starts. That's when the explorer Admiral Pedro Menendez de Aviles landed with his expedition and officially claimed the land for the Spanish Empire. What first started as a military encampment slowly grew into a village and then eventually into a city that would be the center of Spain's power on the Atlantic coast in North America. Now it shouldn't come as a surprise that prior to the arrival of the Spanish there were thousands of indigenous people living on that peninsula that would become Florida and there was a great deal of conflict between them and the new arrivals. For more on that please watch my video on the Mission Nombre de Dios. St. Augustine in Florida would eventually become a British possession and then revert back to Spain until it was finally received by the U.S. in the 1819 adams onis Treaty. Throughout Florida's European history, St. Augustine remained a city and thus is the oldest continuous settlement in the continental U.S. The Tolomato and Huguenot cemeteries, along with the cemetery at the Mission Nombre de Dios and the National Cemetery, make up a quartet of early and important burial grounds in the Old City. While these are all within the tourism area of St. Augustine, note the ubiquitous trolley tour passing by here, so few of St. Augustine's visitors explore them, and it's to their detriment. As followers of this channel know, I'm fascinated by cemeteries and the stories they tell. If you'd like a quick overview about cemeteries, and especially Florida cemeteries, check out this video. I could go on about St. Augustine's history for many hours, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not all that important for an understanding of its cemeteries. Instead, I'll get right to the interviews. The first is with Elizabeth Duran Gesner, President of the Tolomato Cemetery Preservation Association. By the way, the only reason why Tolomato is first is that I visited the cemetery first and it was closest to the free parking space I found. Well, my name is Elizabeth Gessner and I am the president of the Tolomato Cemetery Preservation Association, which maintains Tolomato Cemetery. Uh, the cemetery actually didn't begin as a cemetery, it began as an Indian mission, and the name Tolomato comes from the Indians who lived here. They had a, a village, they were originally from Georgia, but got driven out by attacks of hostile Indians and ended up down here, and were established here for quite some time. They had a church, they had a four-story stone bell tower, and they had a resident priest, but of course all that is gone. Uh, the Spanish left St. Augustine in 1763 and went to Cuba, and the Indians went with them. So all of that has vanished. 
when the Spanish came back in 1784, however, they found that this was actually operating as a cemetery because a group of people called the Menorcans had arrived. The Menorcans arrived during the British period and they were brought here to work as indentured servants on an indigo plantation in New Smyrna Beach. And around behind me, these are mostly Menorcan names on these gravestones here. What happened was that they were kept as virtual slaves down in New Smyrna Beach. They rebelled and they came up here and asked the British governor to set them free. They had actually been indentured to a man named Governor uh, Dr. Turnbull, who wanted to run an indigo plantation. So he, the governor let them in and they went and asked permission to use what they called the Old Catholic Cemetery as the cemetery for the Menorcan community. They were mostly Catholics, some were Greek, Greek Orthodox, and then others were Italians. But they're all, that's what a, that's what a St. Augustine Menorcan refers to this group that started out from Menorca. They're not necessarily ethnic Menorcans, but this is the group that is kind of the basic heritage group. So you're going to see those names all over the place here. Masters, a Pacetti, a Pappy, just, just names that you see on the streets and the business is still to this day. So we have a lot of interesting burials here. You can't see all of them though because we have about a thousand burials here and only about 105 markers. Uh, the names of the people we know because they come from the parish death records. The locations not necessarily unless they have a marker. And uh, a lot of the markers were wood. There, there has been a lot of loss of markers, but some people never had them. And we started actually uh, doing, doing sort of an inventory of it and trying to find out who was buried here when the cemetery association took over, kind of opening it to the public. Well, the uh, the situation was that in uh, 17, uh, 1784, the Spanish returned. They found that this was in use as a cemetery. It then became the parish cemetery for the now the present cathedral that is on the plaza, some maybe five blocks away from here. And uh, records then turned up there are now actually in the diocesan archives. So we, we have all this stuff nailed down here. Uh, the cemetery continued until, 70, uh, me, until 1884. Uh, when it was closed by the city of St. Augustine, along with the Huguenot Cemetery, because there were fears that cemeteries had something to do with the spread of yellow fever. Of course, they didn't, but uh, they thought it was bad air or bad water near cemeteries. And in any case, at that time, there was a movement, for hygienic reasons, to get cemeteries out of city centers and out of really populated areas. So at that point, then, burials that would have gone here went up to Mission Nombre de Dios, where there is a cemetery with about 80 marked burials. And um, the cemetery was closed then in 1884. Now we had an occasional somebody hopping over the wall because they wanted to make sure that they, they could bury their, their recently deceased ancestor with earlier ancestors. But basically, uh, 1892 is the last date we have. So the uh, people buried here, I mean, most of them are just the St. Augustine citizens, but there are some important people. There is uh, Governor Enrique White, second Spanish period governor. Unfortunately, it's unmarked. We know he's here. But where? No idea. And then we have General George Biasu, who was leader of the Haitian Rebellion. And we know he's buried here, but we don't know where either. Uh, people had, of course, to supply their own markers, and sometimes the, the family wouldn't or couldn't for one reason or another, or something happened. In the case of Governor Enrique White, we think one was ordered, but because of blockades during the uh, uh, American, or, well, the lead up to the War of 1812, uh, actually nothing was able to arrive in St. Augustine. So history intervened in many of these cases. We also have uh, Father Miguel O'Reilly, who was a Spanish-educated, Irish-born priest, who was the first priest at the cathedral. We have the first bishop of St. Augustine, Bishop Agustin Vero, who was French. And a host of other people you probably would know about if you lived here, and they're important, but probably the names might not mean much. Although we do have Don Juan McQueen, if, who was a very important figure, and the DAR, in fact, put up a marker for him. 
You can read about all of that in Eugenia Price's books, Maria, you've probably heard of that one, and uh, Don Juan McQueen is the, is the name of another, it's a, it's a trilogy. So uh, that's, and it, actually if you read those books, you'll find a lot of names who are right here right now, but we don't know exactly where they are. We also have the oldest marked burial in the state of Florida. It belongs to a young woman named Elizabeth Forrester, who died in 1798. And she was, she was 16, and she was like many Floridians, she was from the Northeast. Her family moved here from Philadelphia. So we have a huge span of different ethnic and national groups, and we have the, you know, the basic lifeblood of Florida, which is Yankees coming down from the North. We have Civil War burials, we have some of the U.S. colored troops, the USCT, very important in Civil War history and though they were Union troops. And we also have some markers, some veterans markers, for people who served in the Confederate Army. Because in uh, 1952, President Eisenhower declared that they should also get veterans markers as a sign of national reconciliation. Uh, so we have a little bit of everything here. And uh, certainly we're, we're open not very often. We're only open on the third Saturday of the month from 11 to 2, so that's like a three-hour span. <laughs> You've got to be quick to get here. We give free tours, and then we have self-guided tours, or you can just come in and walk around or sit on one of the benches if you're tired doing tourism. And we have a lot of docents who can answer your questions. We have docents who will give tours, and we have people who are doing work on some of the physical things here, like we have somebody cleaning one of the cast iron uh, headstones or not headstones, but cast iron grave enclosures. So I would certainly welcome anybody to come and you know, spend, a, spend an hour or so browsing around here and hearing the stories of St. Augustine. And this is where they're real. This is real history here. All these people were real, they lived here, and they are here now, right now in the cemetery. The Talamato Cemetery is only about three quarters of an acre or 3,000 square meters in size. It's located on Cordova Street, just one block south of Orange Street, which runs past the city gates. The area is quite busy with visitors buzzing by throughout the day. Indeed, it seems the more tourists chat, the happier their trip is. But once you enter Talamato, you're in a more intimate and sacred space. In the old days, this space was located within the city gates and surrounded by small homes and shops, so it would have always been reasonably quiet. The grave markers and tombs are an eclectic mixture of styles, which is one of the best things about early cemeteries. There's little or no restriction on style. The most obvious feature of Tolomato is the white building on the western property line. It's a chapel dedicated to Father Felix Varela, who lived from 1788 to 1853. Varela was born in Cuba, but grew up in St. Augustine. He spent about 30 years of his ministry in New York City, working with Irish immigrants, and moved back to St. Augustine later in life. He was buried here, though since he had worked for Cuban independence, grateful Cubans built this chapel for him. Nearly 60 years later, in 1911, his remains were moved to Cuba and placed in a monument in Havana. This marker on the chapel shows that it was built in 1853, and notice the part above the inscription. It's of an hourglass and bat wings, which represents the phrase, Tempus Fugit, or Time Flies. And while it may seem strange to use bat wings, the bat symbolizes good fortune, brotherhood, and self-confidence in Cuban culture. One of the best bits of good fortune I've had recently was to be at the Talamata Cemetery when a group from the Jimenez Fatio House Museum arrived. The individuals I met are shown here. The museum's archivist, Taryn Rodriguez Boet, told me that their goal in visiting the cemeteries that day was twofold to thank the ancestors that they've researched and portrayed in programs at the Humanis Fatio House for their lives and actions, and thank those that educated the black population in St. Augustine, mainly Bishop Vero. The group visited three areas in the cemetery, one of which was the site of a group of burials of black soldiers who fought in the Union Army during the Civil War. 
These videos show Elizabeth Gesner by one of the soldiers' headstones while members of the Jimenez Fatio group lay down flowers. This is the Bishop Varro tomb in the center of the cemetery along the main pathway. Born in France in 1804, Augustin Varro became a bishop for Florida in 1857 before the state had its own diocese. Prior to and during the Civil War, he was an advocate for slavery, though he also encouraged humane treatment of the enslaved. After the war, he issued a pastoral letter that called upon Catholics to put away prejudice against formerly enslaved people and to elevate their welfare. He also urged his fellow bishops to provide funding and resources for black schools and churches. In 1870, Varro became the first bishop of the Diocese of St. Augustine, the office he held until his death in 1876. James Bullock speaks. We realize that you can't have lived your whole life and not have contributed. Our guess now is, is that they contributed mightily, as he did, as all of the people here, layer after layer after layer. So we are standing, as they would say in the Civil Rights Movement, we are standing on the shoulders of our ancestors. The gift we have is what they gave us by way of sacrifice. So again, this is not for the publicity of it. This is for our gift and way of honoring. The third area in the Tolomato Cemetery that the Jimenez Fatio House visited was the northwest quadrant of the cemetery, where enslaved individuals were buried. James Bullock speaks once again, this time beginning with a reading from the opening of Psalm 69 in the Old Testament. If this was home for these people after a life of work, I wonder what they think about their lives. But Psalm 69 to the chief musician says this, Save me, O God, for the waters come into my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. They that hate me without cause are more than hairs on mine head. They that want destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. Let not them that wait on thee be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face, I have become a stranger to my brethren and an alien to my mother's children. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. So, the most humblest of people, I think, not by choice. But if you had a gift to give, you would give something if you could. So for all of them, again, if this is as I understand it, the section of the cemetery divided into fourths. If you had money and status that determined where you were buried. If you were an enslaved person or could not pay for your own burial, this is where you ended up in this corner. So it seems fitting that, I don't know, is if there is equality in death, then this is where you found it. From the slave area in Tolomato, we walked only a couple blocks north to the Huguenot Cemetery. And at this point, I'll let Charles Tingley, the president of the Friends of the Huguenot Cemetery Incorporated, provide an overview of the cemetery. Good afternoon. My name is Charles Tingley and I'm the president of the Friends of the Huguenot Cemetery. We are a non-denominational, non-profit organization whose sole purpose is the restoration and interpretation of the Huguenot Cemetery here in St. Augustine, Florida. 
Now, calling it the Huguenot Cemetery is a misnomer. This is a name that was invented by tour guides uh, in the middle of the 19th century. You know how it always says, it always sounds better if you say it in French? Uh, sauce Léonaise sounds better than mustard sauce. So they started calling this the Huguenot Cemetery, which just means Protestant in French. Um, before then, it was called the Public Burying Grounds or the Public Cemetery. It is owned by the Memorial Presbyterian Church. Uh, but it was opened in 1821 very much as an emergency measure. Florida became an American territory on July 10th, 1821. A few weeks later, the town is hit with a yellow fever epidemic. And so many of the newly arrived Americans uh, were dying from yellow fever. And the new people looked around and we've got to find a place to bury these people. So this land's adjacent to the fort and they thought it was government land and they started burying people. Our earliest uh, burial here is I.G. Hapholt, who died August 15th, uh, 1821. That's a full month before the cemetery officially opened. And this is one of the reasons why last year, as part of the commemoration of the 200th anniversary of the annexation of Florida by the United States uh, uh, from Spain, uh, that the cemetery was put on the National Register of Historic Places. It continues to be the cemetery for non-Catholics uh, up until 1884 when it was closed by city ordinance due to overcrowding. The cemetery is unusual for a number of reasons, uh, one of which is that because we had no resident headstone manufacturer in St. Augustine, for most of the 19th century, it has a wide variety of headstone styles and materials uh, for such a small cemetery. So we have Egyptian revival monuments, Greek revival monuments, uh, we have Gothic revival monuments, uh, we have New Hampshire granite monuments, Italian marble, Vermont marble, uh, even one sandstone monument. Uh, so we, we from an aesthetic point of view of the history of mortuary art in the 19th century, uh, we, we have a lot of bang for the buck here. So I would welcome any of you to come to the Huguenot Cemetery on the third Saturday of the month from uh, 11 until 2 o'clock, weather permitting. Uh, and if you can't come, we have a book for sale on the history of the cemetery. Uh, it's available at the St. Augustine's Visitors Information Center. There is also a Wikipedia website for the Huguenot Cemetery, which has a list of the burials as recorded in 1892. Uh, and there is a Facebook page for the Friends of the Huguenot Cemetery, which illustrates some of the restoration work uh, that our group has done over the last 25 years. So please come and uh, see this little piece of history. Thank you. Like Tolomato, the Huguenot is roughly square in shape. It appears that it's larger in size to some people, but that's probably because it's open to streets on three of its sides, unlike the Tolomato. The size is about two-thirds of an acre, or 2,600 square meters, so there's not really much of a difference. It gives the impression of being more open as well. Because of its location, it's often quite noisy, with Route A1A on the eastern side and the old city gates in the Castillo de San Marcos, as you can see here. The tourist trolley passes by constantly on two sides, and you can catch a bit of the spiel the narrators share about the cemetery. Still, it's a beautiful cemetery with many interesting markers and tombs to explore, and at least when you're in the grounds, the bustle of the city becomes mostly background noise and falls away when you begin to connect with the individuals buried here. I was smart enough to walk with the Jimenez Fatio group to the Huguenot Cemetery as we all wished to visit both graveyards. At the cemetery, the group began by finding some of the graves that are connected with the people they portray at the museum. I introduced a group earlier, but this is a good time to introduce their characters. James Bullock, described as the group's fearless leader, portrays Moses, a character representing the many butlers that probably worked at the Jimenez Fatio house. 
Charmin Russell portrays Ms. Kate, a character representing the many cooks that worked at the house. Cheyenne Koth is representing Annie Whitehurst, who came to St. Augustine in 1829 with her mother, Eliza. Eliza is known to have managed the house. Both mother and daughter were buried at the Huguenot Cemetery. Taryn Rodriguez Boet represented the Jimenez Pelliker family, who built the house in 1798 and was buried at Tolomato. The other participants in the group's walk represented the many women owners and workers at the house. The group was part of the museum's specialty program titled I Lived Here As Well, A Woman's Story, which ran in February and March. It told the story of urban slavery from the woman's perspective. I have to admit that I haven't visited the Humanis Fatio house, which is on Avil Street just a couple blocks south of the old city's plaza. I'll correct that error as soon as possible, and I'm sure a video will be forthcoming. The group stopped at the grave sites of slave owners and acknowledged them. Um, may they find forgiveness. May they reach out to any people that they exploited or harmed in some way and find that togetherness and brotherhood. And for our last stop, we will pay homage to the people who would have been enslaved during the period of 1821 and afterwards. And sadly, many of these people are just a first name on a list with an age and some physical attributes. And then they moved to the area where enslaved individuals were buried, the Northwest Quadrant the same location as in Tolomato. There they again honored the people buried beneath, and this time Bullock and Russell sang the song Dirt Floor by musician Chris Whitley. Lose your troubles Let them fall away There's a dirt floor Underneath here to receive us, the changes fail. May the future be forgotten. Let them fall away. Many thanks from us individually from those who've been involved in the I Live Here As Well project, the Patio House, from our families to these families, without names, without recognition, may that be changed. Heavenly grace above. Amen. There's a dirt floor underneath here to receive us when changes fail. May this shovel lose your trouble, let them fall away. I suppose there's little else to say about my experiences at these two historic St. Augustine cemeteries. On nice days, St. Augustine is filled with tourists from all over the country and the world. With its deep Spanish heritage and its slowly resurfacing indigenous and black history, it's a unique city in continental America. The Huguenot and Tolomato are oases among a busy city, and like all oases, they're rather difficult to visit. For many years, they've only been open for a few hours on the third Saturday of each month. Yes, this can be thought of as inconvenient, but in a way, it's appropriate. Their unique space in the old city is much better glimpsed through the fence line by most of the tourists, and those who really wish to walk on the sacred ground can make arrangements. Certainly, those who are buried there aren't going anywhere. I'd like to thank Elizabeth Duran Gesner and Charles Tingley for their help and the group from the Jimenez Fatio House Museum for their wonderful visit to the cemeteries. I'll put links to their websites in the comments. Thank you for watching another of my videos. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel to learn more about Florida's tourism history. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.